want to encourage you today. We're getting into the Christmas season now. And I want to ask you your help this morning with something. Did you know that 91, this is a recent uh, survey, 91% of Americans celebrate Christmas. 47% said they will or want to go to a Christmas Eve worship experience. And that's why we have Christmas Eve worship experiences. This year we're having two at 5.30 and 7. And if you're going to be in town, I would ask you two things. Please bring, consider bringing your family and your friends. It's a great worship experience. We're going to have a candlelight part. And uh, there's going to be just an awesome atmosphere. This is a great time for you to bring your family and your friends. I'm going to preach Christ. And, you know, last year, you know, scores of people received Jesus. And I want to encourage you to, uh, to join us on Christmas Eve. The second thing I'm going to ask you to do is as you leave today is to please take two invite cards. They're going to pass them out as you leave. And please consider inviting people. I'm going to be doing this. I'm going to invite people myself. Think about your neighbor, your coworker, your family member, Purdue fans. It just got beat. Hoosiers won. Come on. We're so full of love here at City Church. It's just amazing. God be glorified. But. I want to encourage you to, to take these and help us to invite people. It's going to be two great worship experiences. It's going to be an hour long. And so you can get back home to your family. You're going to have a holiday photo booth. It's going to be a lot of fun. And uh, I believe we're going to uh, take advantage of a celebration of Christ's birth for people coming to him and for honoring him as a family and with their friends. Amen? So thank you for doing that. If you want to turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 13, uh, feel free of your phones or follow me on the screen. You know, love is a powerful force. I pray that all of us have felt it at some you know, measure in our life because really it has the power to melt a hard heart. Love has the power to bring people together. It's the fabric that really creates new families. And love is an invisible touch too that really opens our heart to give and receive and be changed in the process. And yet you and I have a daily task in our series vote. We have a choice to make, love versus lust. Now right now when I said lust, you think, probably of sexual things, and that's true, but also lust deals with lusting after power, lusting after money, lusting after dominance. It's, it's beyond our sexuality, and you and I have an ongoing choice to make in this area, and what we choose in this area really impacts so many areas of our lives. So it's my hope here at City that you and I, that we choose to love when it's easy to love, and we choose to love when it's hard. Because the Bible says nothing can separate us from the love of God. Amen? So in our uh, verse today, I want to read verses 4 through 7. Paul is describing what love is, what real love is. And here's what it says. Love is patient and kind. It is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable. It keeps no record of being wrong. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. Father, I thank you for this 1030 worship experience. Those here, those watching us online, I'm honored to be a part of this great church. Bless this message. Help it change me and all of us to be more like you. In Jesus' name, everyone said. You know, every day you and I have a uh, task before us, <clears throat> no matter our age, our demographic, to really choose, vote for our series, Love Versus Lust. The Bible, I believe, God represents what real love is, and you and I are faced with a counterfeit love literally every single day. Did you know, the, uh, for some, the hero of peace, Gandhi, read the New Testament while he was in South Africa by himself. He read the whole thing through. After reading it through, he said it was the greatest love story he had ever come across, and he wanted to learn about Jesus and to discover this love for himself. He went to a church in South Africa on a Sunday morning, and there was an elder of that church standing on the front steps, I guess greeting or doing whatever. And Gandhi, of course, was from India. And he, as he was approaching the church and approaching the steps, the man said, what are you doing here? And Gandhi said, I want to come to church. I've read the New Testament. I want to learn about this love. And the man said, you don't belong in this church. And Gandhi turned around and walked away. I want you to think about the power of the love of God and how the love of God is so vast and so powerful because the Bible says, for God so loved the world. Meaning, ladies and gentlemen, that God loves us no matter our circumstance, our position, our struggle. He unconditionally loves you and I. 
Now, this is past our brain because we are conditional people. We're conditional lovers. We're conditional friends. And, and it's bad to say, but we are. We're you know, programmed. You do this for me, then I'm inclined to do this for you. And if you don't do this for me, it's, it's difficult for me to do this for you. Amen? It's just the way we are. But God says, I love you no matter if you love me back. I love you no matter if you curse me, believe in me, or do whatever. I still love you full measure, no matter what, every day. This is the unconditional love of God. And this love is, is beyond, it transcends our ability. This love is given to all who receive. And really, our mission, if you have received Christ today, you're a Christian. If you haven't, I pray that you do. Here at City, we give you the space uh, to go at your pace in your journey of faith, and that's okay. But when you and I receive Jesus, our mission at, after that point is to receive more of the love of God to touch our own heart so that we can obey what Jesus said in Matthew 22. Summed up, love God, love people. Everyone say, love God, love people. That is our challenge. And how many know it's a difficult challenge at best? And yet this is what God wants us to do. I believe the love of God is the greatest mirror of our lives. I'm going to read this today again. I'm going to go through these uh, verses point by point, and I want to compare what the love of God is versus what lust is. And I want you to see how challenged I am, how challenged we all are, because the love of God is the greatest mirror on showing us to be more like him. Really, the love of God is the gauge. It's the ultimate gauge, should be, of our spirituality. Because how we love God and people really says it all. We can know a whole lot, but like the gentleman who rejected Gandhi for being of a different ethnicity, I mean, that doesn't really impress me, his knowledge. He's long gone from this earth. But he altered a man's course of destiny because God was reaching for that soul. You and I are commissioned to love God, love people, no matter what. After all, God has loved us the same. So when you think of love versus lust, I want you to think about this. As I read this today, this is our standard of love. This is our example of love. And consider this. This is the guidelines, biblically, for love. You know, be it a friendship, a romance, a parenting relationship, what have you. This is the guideline for you and I to love people now watch this. It's also the guidelines that we can have as criteria for someone else to love us so that we don't get into a bad situation, an abusive situation, or manipulation. So notice this. I'm just going to read in order what I read from verses 4 through 7, and I'm going to contrast the point, the opposite point of lust. The Bible says that the love of God is patient. Aren't you glad that God is patient with you and I? Because Lord knows, if we're honest, we have resisted God, we have ran away from God, we've probably said no, and he is patient towards you and I. Lust, however, is impatient. Lust says, give me what I want right now. I don't care what you do or how you do it, I want what I want right now. Give it to me or there'll be consequences. That's impatience. Again, as I'm going through this, don't think just about sex, think about other things too, but if that includes you, then then obviously, yes. Love, the love of God is kind. Lust is unkind. The love of God is not jealous. This is a big one. The love of God is not jealous, but lust is jealous. There's so many people that are tempted to be jealous of their spouse, jealous of their children, jealous of people around them, jealous of what they have. Jealous, jealous, jealous. Folks, if you and I are jealous, that's not a sign of the love of God. The love of God removes jealousy from us so that we are not jealous of others, but we are happy for others. The love of God is not boastful. There's another hard one. The love of God is not boastful, and lust is a braggart. How many have been tempted to ever brag before? I am. My grandfather used to always joke to me. Uh, he had a lot of accomplishments in his life, and probably his greatest one was his family. And some of his old buddies, as they got into their older years, would, you know, he would you know, meet them randomly in Indianapolis, and they would say, Woody, how you doing? He said, I'm doing good. And you know, Woody, you know, my grandfather would ask them, how you doing? Oh, I'm doing great. I have 10 grandchildren. I have eight grandchildren. Some of us have 13. And my grandfather would just hold off on purpose. He would just hold off. He, he would tell me, I just held off, Dave. I just held off. I just bit my tongue. Until finally his friend would say, how's your family? How many grandchildren do you have? And he would say, I have 21 grandchildren. 
He was so proud of that. And so maybe there's a good brag. I don't know. Maybe that's not even scriptural. But maybe I should stay with the word. But, but, in, but in truth, all of us have been tempted to brag. A braggart is not representing the love of God. Because a braggart is someone that's insecure trying to prove their worth when someone that's filled with the love of God doesn't have to brag because they're satisfied at being accepted with God. This is challenging, isn't it? The love of God is not prideful. This is a massive one, probably the biggest one on this list. The love of God is not prideful, but lust is prideful. Every human being deals with pride at some level in some way. It's the kryptonite of our humanity. You and I have to tackle and wrestle down pride. I have it, you have it, we all do. And yet the love of God causes us, again, this is not instantaneous. What I'm reading today is really a lifelong journey. But if you and I embrace it, the power of God will help us and move in us. The more of the love of God we have, the more empowerment we have to shove out pride and receive the opposite, which is humility. The love of God is not rude. Lust is rude. The love of God is selfless. For God so loved the world, he gave his only son. Jesus, he overcame the shame of dying naked on the cross, and he did it for you and I so that you and I could have him for eternity. It was the ultimate selfless act. We love love stories that are talking about a selfless act. We read books, we watch movies about it, and yet the greatest love story of them all is Jesus. And it may be awkward for men to you know, think of it that way, but we gotta think out, out of the terms of romance and think about the love of God that melts our heart and that gives us life eternal. It is the greatest love story of all time. The ultimate selfless act, and yet, and yet lust is selfish. Everything about lust is self-absorbed. Everything about lust is me, myself, and I right now. It's everything I want, and I don't care what you have to do to give it to me. I want what I want now. Now, I want you to think about these uh, first few. Think about how challenged I am and you are to overcome being impatient unkind, jealous, braggart, prideful, rude, selfish. This is the crux of our faith. This is why at City, I preach along these lines every weekend because while I love knowledge and I love theology and I love history, and I think it's wonderful to know that stuff, and we will help you know that stuff as you want to. It's important to know what you believe. However, knowledge puffs up, Paul said, but love builds up. Knowledge doesn't change who we are. The love of God changes who we are from the inside out. I'm not trying to pick on any one person, but I want you to think about a man who was an elder of a church who rejected someone because he wasn't white in an apartheid nation. And think about how fickle and how ridiculous that was, but he had knowledge, but the love of God, there was something off in his heart. So how easy it is for us to say, well, I know this, but that's wonderful, but how's the application of the love of God? Do we love red, yellow, black, white, and brown? Do we love Republican and Democrat? Do, <laughs> do we love people? Because I want you to think about how much has God loved you and I? Think about the immense love of God given to you and I and how much we don't deserve it, but yet how much he gives it to us. The love of God I use this word to kind of contrast it. The scripture says the love of God is not irritable, so just stay with me. So the, so the love of God is controlled. Lust is irritable. How many have ever been irritable before? Half of you, not so much? Okay, you can repent in about 10 minutes. I was irritable over the holidays, and Summer said, you need just to be in your room for two hours. I said, fine. And I woke up filled with Jesus. And I told her it was your fault. <laughs> and then she shut the door on me again. Praise the Lord. But <laughs> this is interesting. This is probably my favorite. The love of God, the Bible says, keeps no record of wrong. Now I want you to think about how much wrong we have done to God and to our fellow man. And some would say, well, man, I haven't done anything wrong physically or outwardly. And that's true. But the nature of humanity is to hurt, hurt people, hurt people, right? And so there's nothing that any of us can do to not hurt people. 
If you don't believe me, just get married. Then sooner or later, you will hurt your spouse and they will hurt you. Hopefully not physically, just in the ebb and flow of life. And I'm not making light of, of hurting one another. I know some people are abused. I'm, I'm not trying to do that. So just hear me. Keeping no record of being wronged. There, think about how God, you and I both know we're not innocent. We know we're not free and clean. But when Jesus comes, he erases our wrong, ladies and gentlemen, and he doesn't remember any record of wrong. Therefore, you and I, because of Jesus, are justified and cleaned in the sight of God. Now, I want you to think about how phenomenal that point right there is, and that will make you praise God the rest of your life because all of us know where we've been. All of us know what we're capable of, and the love of God removes the record of wrong. But here's what lust does. Lust keeps records of wrong, keeps score. You didn't do this, you didn't do that, and you did this, so I'll do that. Folks, that's a recipe for a relationship breaker. That's a recipe for you being isolated from all relationships because in reality, none of us will ever provide everything for our significant other or our friend or whatnot because we're all flawed. We have to get that from God. And so we are challenged not to hold records of wrong against spouses, our children, our friends, our coworkers. Man, it's hard, isn't it? But I want you to think about how practical this is because as we leave today, every one of us has people on our brain, if we are honest, that we probably are keeping a record of. And it probably feels good. And we probably want to tell them our mind. And we're like a DJ. We want to scratch the record and have it play over and over again at the part that they heard us. Ten years ago, what the what? 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 You hurt, what the what? You hurt, what the what? You hurt, me, 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 me. Like Grandmaster Flash up in this piece. <laughs> that just all came to me. I feel so awesome right now. I don't know how that happened. I, let's record that. This is amazing. I don't know. I'm a rapper. I don't know. <laughs> The love of God likes justice. Lust likes injustice. Now, please know that for what we're facing in our country, really around the world, but in our country particularly, with injustices on multiple levels, all right? Education, gender, ethnicity, it just keeps on going. Economic, it just keeps going. Please know the book of Proverbs is full of verses that the Bible talks about having honest judges, having a judicial system that is honest and clean. And so I'm not suggesting that it's not. I think some parts probably aren't, some parts are. We need to pray for our judges because God wants an honest judicial system. God loves justice. The love of God thrives in justice. Lust, however, thrives in injustice. So think about, for example, I'm not picking on judges, but but there was a judge within the last uh, year and a half who was arrested and it was proven he was taking money under the table, sending kids to juvenile and even harsher punishment than they deserved, okay? So lust, again, is more than sex. Think about power, control, manipulation, right? Domination. So that man was allured by lust of power and control and he was thriving on injustice of children, sending them off to uh, things they didn't deserve, Okay? but the love of God loves justice. The love of God is truth. Jesus said, I am the way, capital W, the life, capital L, the truth. He is the way, truth, and life. And so the love of God is truth. But I want you to think about this. Lust thrives, feeds on lies. Now I want you to think about this, and let's be honest. I have lusted in my life. How many in this room and online have ever lusted in your life of something or someone? God bless you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Think back to that point, or if you're in that struggle right now, no condemnation, think with me. When you and I are operating our life in lust, most likely there's a lie that's accompanying it. Because we're thriving on deception, and deception is fueling our lust. See, affairs 
are, and it's been proven as, as people have you know, commented and as, as in a research, affairs awaken the senses of excitement because it's all based on deception and lies. Hiding what someone else doesn't know and the thrill of that, but how many know that ends to destruction? God wants us to live in truth. Truth sets us free. Truth protects us. Truth allows healing to come to us. Lying causes lust to fuel and grow at whatever you know, means and way it's flowing. So I want to encourage you today, if there's any lying in your life to yourself or others, please consider cutting it off. Stop it. Because if we're lying, then chances are we're fueling lust in some area, and God wants us to come to the truth and be set free. The love of God doesn't quit. Lust does quit. Leaving on a drop of a hat, pivoting, changing directions. I love you, I love you, I love you. I love, oh, you're the, I mean, you're the greatest, you're my friend. I'll never, you know, you're the awesome. One thing happens, they pivot. I'll never talk to you again. That's, that's a form of fickleness that's a product that's not in the love of God that's in another form. Just quitting on a drop of a hat, quitting on a dime. Others, it takes more time to quit. The point is, the love of God doesn't quit. The love of God is faithful. How many are glad for the faithfulness of the love of God? The lust component loses faith and gives up. The love of God is hopeful. Lust is hopeless. I'd like you to consider if any one of us today are struggling with illicit sexual behaviors, physically or viewing, if we're out of control in that area of our life, if we're out of control with manipulation, power control, if we're out of control with you know, seeking domination, seeking whatever that is, chances are there's an area deep inside of us that we're hopeless. We're just kind of given up. We're just kind of like it doesn't matter. But when we're hopeful, it helps us to live right because we're hoping that something good is coming to us in our life from God. Because the Bible says his plans are good and of peace and not of evil, to give us hope and an expected end. So if we are filled with hopelessness, chances are we've lost constraint and we don't care anymore. So I want to encourage you to let hope come back in your heart if you're struggling with hopelessness today because God has something better for you. The love of God finally endures. Lust fades away. I want to encourage you today that the love of God changes us. The love of God, real love, changes us. Real love reveals us. Our journey, I'm not going to be too much longer, our journey, after you receive Christ, our journey in this thing is really to not become a Pharisee and a Sadducee. That's a scriptural title of basically for how we would call it fake Christians. That's why they were sad, you see. That's why they're not fair, you see. <laughs> Isn't that a dumb joke? That was dumb. These are very dumb Christian jokes. The rap was better, wasn't it? Amen. Our temptation, though, is to gravitate to being a Pharisee and a Sadducee. Again, think about the man Here's Gandhi in his house in South Africa reading the New Testament all the way through, coming out of that reading, wanting to know Jesus and this love that was written about, and a man is rejecting another man because of his ethnicity. How shallow. God is reaching for us today that we would, in spite of ourselves, trust me, I'm in this process with you, we would let the love of God go deeper down in us and melt the walls, melt the hardness, melt the excuses, melt the whatever, and slowly but surely, we become more like Christ. We choose to love when it's easy, and we choose to love when it's hard. And when it's hard is where we get tested the most, don't we? I want you to consider today how you're voting every day. You and I, me, this is past week, uh, someone hacked my Facebook, or I don't know what they did, but they sent me a, porn, a pornographic picture. I told Summer, it ticked me off. I have safeguards in my phone, safeguards in my iPad, 
I love my wife enough and my kids enough and I love you enough to stay pure. And I want to be an example to the young men in our, in our church that I don't have any time to jack around in that way because it's a waste of my time and it will destroy everything God has blessed me with. But how many know that lust seeks us out? It comes and knocks on our door and wants us to let it in in any mode that it is. And so I want to encourage you to let the love of God touch you and to consider how are you voting? Are we voting for love? Are we voting for lust? And what is that? And today, just know it's not going to end after we leave this building. It's going to keep on going. And so our choice is going to be in the privacy of our lives, in the public eye, when our fellow brother or sister or fellow man is good or not good to us, what will we do? How will we respond? This is the revelation of Christ in us, the hope of glory. Consider in closing how much love the power of God has given to you and I. You know, the mercy of God is given to us every day. New mercy every day. I need new mercy every day. The mercy of God keeps us from what we deserve. Oh, how we've deserved a lot. But he keeps us from it with mercy. Then grace gives us what we don't deserve. Take your next step today. I want to encourage you. I say this every week. Come to the worship experiences. For others, go to Build next month. Join a life group starting in January. Join a team. Get connected. Insulate yourself with support because this final message is so important because every day we'll have a choice of love or lust. And I pray you and me both have the power to choose the love of God. Let's stand to our feet if you don't mind in this worship experience. You online, please respond as you feel comfortable and led. Please bow your heads if you don't mind today. We're just gonna respect everyone and pray here. As your head is bowed, how many would say today, Pastor Dave, I've, I've never received Jesus. And what I mean by that is you haven't asked God to come in your heart through his son Jesus and his Holy Spirit lives in you and you become a new person. It's, it's, it's slow and sure, but it happens. And he makes us a new person. You've never done that. Or others would say, I have done that in my life, but I'm not close to God. I'm disconnected from him. And I want to get reconnected today. If that's you, in either way, raise your hand right now, and I want to pray for you to come to Jesus for the first time or to come back. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Isn't that awesome? God bless you. I see you. God bless you. Come on. God bless you. People are coming. To, God bless you. God bless you. I see you. It's great. Five people coming to Jesus today. Keep your head back a little bit longer and have them to say, Pastor Dave, and trust me, I'm making this choice every day, and it faces my life along with yours, and you would say, Pastor Dave, I want the strength to choose love. I want the strength to choose the love of God. I don't want to choose lust in any form. I want to choose the love of God. If that's you, raise your hand right now. I want to pray for you today in this area of our lives. God bless you. Hands everywhere. Follow me in this prayer so no one's left out. Please say, Lord Jesus, my heart is yours, and I come to you giving you me take residence in my life in both public and private parts of my life I give you me by the power of the Holy Spirit give me the courage to choose love when it's difficult I choose love when I don't feel like it I choose love when I'm weak and I choose love when I'm tempted. I am yours. In Jesus' name. If you don't mind raising your hands if you want, I pray for every one of us to be healed in our heart today. In this massive subject of our lives, I pray that we would be healed and touched and moved on by the Holy Spirit. That we would be cleaned by God and walking in His love. Please sing with Josh and Pastor Renee. Then I'll come back and we'll have response time. You are matchless in grace and mercy. There is nowhere we can hide from your love. You are steadfast, never failing. 
you are faithful. All creation is in all of who you are. And we say, God with us, God for us, nothing can come against, no one can stand between us. God with us, God for us, nothing can come against, no one can stand between us. No, no, His love is strong, nothing can separate us. He's the healer, He's the healer of the sick and the broken. You are comfort for every heart that mourns. Our King, our Savior forever. For eternity, we will sing of all you've done. For eternity, we will sing of all you've done. And we sing. between us God with us God for us nothing can come against no one can stand between us how many receive that today we receive the love of God I ask the prayer team to join me here at the altar today and what we're going to do is if you're new we give you a chance to respond to God as you feel comfortable and as you feel led. So if you receive Jesus today, I want to encourage you to come down and receive one of these Bibles that will help you take your next step. If you raise your hands and you want to receive prayer for something you heard today, or you have a prayer request about something totally different, that's fine. Come up and we will pray with you. If you want to take communion here at City, we let you take communion on your own with your family and your friends. And so it's in the back and it's in the front. And you can sit in your seat and just worship and listen as they sing. And then they'll dismiss probably about three to five minutes. And we want we want you to have a chance to respond as you feel led. If you want prayer, come down the middle aisle. If you want communion, please go back or come down the side aisles. May the Lord bless you. May his face shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious to you. May the Lord be good to you. May the Lord give you his peace. And for this message, may he give you and I the strength and the courage to choose love when it's easy and when it's hard every day of our life. In Jesus' name, let's respond to God.